are proud to bring dance, music, and yoga classes into pre-COVID 150 schools a week. We're back in 110 now after losing all of our clients overnight. So we're so happy wow, about that. <laughs> um, and <laughs> yeah, it's been a wild ride. I'm sure it has been for all of us, right? Anyone in education and working with families and children, it's been really rough couple years. But with that being said, some good things came out of it. I did get a book deal with my favorite children's publishing company during COVID. Yoga Adventure was a book that I wrote um, with Barefoot Books, which is based in the East Coast. And they um, do all sorts of really beautiful, culturally diverse and inclusive books. And I've had a working relationship with them for many years. And they finally picked up one of my manuscripts. And then I also, a local publishing company, Rockridge Press, I wrote The Vegetarian Cookbook for Kids. So we had some, I had some fun doing creative stuff that I never would have had time to do otherwise, right? Um, so today I'm here to do a workshop with you called Learning Through Music, Dance, and Yoga. Full disclosure, I normally struggle to fit this into an hour and a half. <laughs> so we are going to start on time and hopefully more people will come um, so that we can get through as much as we can. Um, whenever I go anywhere, I just want to give you like as much free stuff as I can because you're taking time out of your day to be here, and I want you. I know that like what what is valuable to you may not be valuable to you, right? And vice versa. So I want to make sure everybody leaves today with something that they feel like they can implement in their classroom immediately. Um, there is a clipboard going around, and if you could write down your email and make sure that it's legible so I can read it, <laughs> I will send you the notes, and I'll also send you a link. Um, almost everything we're doing today is on our free YouTube channel, so if you uh, can't remember something, it's a great resource. And then also we have a Teachers Pay Teachers page with lots of free downloads and resources. And I will send you that link too so you can use all the free stuff that we've been working on. We have almost 600 videos on our YouTube channel now. And I've spent like maybe 12 or 13 years like continuously posting. So use it, it's a free resource. And um, I want you guys to know about it. So. Let's get started. Let me ask you first, how many of you are working with children under the age of two? Nobody. Okay. How many of you are working with two to five? Okay. And how many of you are working with five to seven? Okay. And then anyone over seven? Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So we are going to get started learning through music, dance, and yoga. In this workshop, we'll explore how music, dance, and yoga can be used as a tool to support all five areas of development, cognitive speech and language, gross motor development, fine motor development, social and emotional learning. For each area of development, we will give examples of music, dance, and or yoga activities that can be done to support and foster the growth of that area of development. Since I'm guessing that all of you are pretty seasoned in your, has in, is anyone like in their first year of teaching? No. Okay. So we're going to skip some of this so that we can get to more activities. So what I'm going to do is instead of um, giving you examples of each one, I'm just going to do a super brief description and then we're going to go into the activities since I know that you guys all know what the example, some examples of cognitive development are. Okay. Just so that we can get more activities in. So we're going to start with cognitive development. Cognitive development refers to how a child's how children think, explore, and figure things out. It is the development of knowledge, skills, problem solving, and the dispositions which help children think about and understand the world around them. Brain development is part of cognitive development. Anytime a child is engaging in play, they are building their cognitive skills. So I'm gonna give you a couple examples of fun ways that you can work on your ABCs with your students um, that is a little bit different because I know I get sick of singing the ABCs, the way that we sing it over and over again. So I wanted to teach you some creative, fun ways that you could learn the ABCs with your students or change the lyrics. And I find that with a song like the ABCs, it's really easy for the children to understand. Am I, ta am I yelling at you? No. I feel like with the mask, I'm like always yelling. So if I'm like yelling at you, just be like, calm down, Jamaica. I won't be offended if you shout at me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, I feel like, I don't probably don't need to talk quite that loud. I feel like children really, um, when they have a tune or a melody, like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, the ABCs, here we go around the mulberry bush, it's much easier for them to focus on learning the new language. Their brain isn't working quite so hard to also learn 
all the melody and the tempo and all of those things, right? So I like to change the words to different songs that they already know, and I feel like we do a lot of that in early childhood education. So I just want to give you some examples of fun ways that you can do that with your students. So we're going to start with A, B, C, D, dinosaur. When I say big, can you stretch your arms up really high? And when I say small, can you make your body really small? Here we go. A, B, C, D, dinosaur. That is what the D stands for. Some are big. Show me your big arms. And some are small. I like dinosaurs most of all a b c d dinosaur that is what the d stands for so we're going to start with the really simple version and then i'm going to give you something you can do with older children so let's do another really simple version that you could do with maybe your twos your threes a is for airplane, airplane. you are so smart <laughs> A is for airplane flying high. B is for boat floating by. C is for car driving fast. Look at all the fun things we have passed. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Next time won't you sing with me? So again, super simple. We're just simply changing the words and the lyrics. Another one that I like to do when we talk about animals that live in the wild. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. G is for tall giraffes eating green leaves. They have long necks. Where's your neck? That stretch up high. Reach all the way up to the sky. All the way up to the sky. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. G is for tall giraffes eating green leaves. So very, very simple. All of these lyrics are in the notes that I'll send you, but they're all also on YouTube. So I may do that with my threes, my twos, and then when they get a little bit older, I'm gonna do something a little bit more complicated. I'm gonna introduce them to a new ABC song. So this, um, the reason why I'm picking this one is because um, it's an original song that we wrote, and the lyrics, and there's also great fine motor activities we have on our Teachers Pay Teachers page that you can download for free to go with it. So I wanted to do something that you guys would be able to get more tools if you like the song and you want to introduce it to your class. So this is one that I would do with my pre-K students or even my kindergarten students, my, maybe my older threes, depending on your older threes. <laughs> and it goes like this. I want you to sing... Animal ABCs, come sing along with me. Can you try that? Mm -hmm. Animal ABCs, come sing along with me. A letter for each animal is easy as one, two, three. Can you try that? A letter for each animal is easy as one, two, three. I'm frozen. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to just sing that part, and then I'll continue, and then you're going to come in halfway through the song. Visual to go with it, and it goes like this. Animal ABCs, come sing along with me. Sing with me. A letter for each animal is easy as one, two, three. You got it. A is for alligator and B is for bat. C makes a sound. It's the first letter in cat. D is for dog and E is for elephant. F makes a sound. F, 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 my fish's name is Trent. G is for gorilla and H is for horse. Nay, I is for iguana, who's a herbivore, of course. J is a jiggling jellyfish and K is a koala bear. L is for lion, whose mane is made of hair. M is for monkey swinging through the trees. N is for Norwell, 
the unicorn of the sea. You sing, animal ABCs, come sing along with me. A letter for each animal, it's easy as one, two, three. You got it. <laughs> O is for octopus, and P is for pig. Q makes a sound, qu -qu quail sitting on a twig. R is for rabbit, and sloth starts with S. T is for toucan sitting in a nest. U is for urchin, and vulture starts with V. Oh, W is for a wolf howling peacefully. Woo! X ray treacherous starts with X and Y is for yak. Z Z Z is for zebra with stripes down his back. You sing. Animal ABCs, come sing along with me. A letter for each animal is easy as one, two, three. You got it. Let me take a breath. Okay, <laughs> um, so I really like to stress teaching those cognitive skills in fun, creative ways because I was that child growing up who was dyslexic, who struggled academically, and the way that I learned almost everything was by making up rhymes and songs. I never knew that I grew up to create a business that worked with thousands of kids now doing that, but I think it's really important that as educators, we're always thinking of ways that we can reach all of our students and not every child is gonna be reachable in the same way, right? Like every child has a unique way of learning and so the more different ways that we can learn these cognitive skills in different ways that aren't necessarily like traditional ways that we would teach them is a great way for children to thrive and actually start to build confidence because growing up for me, I really felt crummy about myself in the classroom. It wasn't until I got to my after school activities and it was dance and music and yoga that I actually had any confidence. And if I didn't have those activities, I would have been a really sad child. And so I just share that story with you because it may seem silly to be making up songs and doing all the things we do with children, but it's the way that many children are gonna be able to learn. So just keep that in mind. We're gonna move on to the next activity, which is not about our ABCs, but another co cognitive skill is about learning our shapes. So, I have a couple different things here. I'm gonna pass everybody a scarf, because we're gonna do a couple different activities with the scarves. So if you wanna grab a scarf, you can grab one. These haven't been used by children in a really, really, really long time, so you don't need to worry about children's germs on them. <laughs> Actually, I don't think they've ever been used by children. These are my adult scarves. <laughs> <laughs> These colors are great. They have to tell you as much as I love supporting like shore and discount school supplies and all of the companies that are in our Um I will tell you that you can find you can find good ones. Got it? There you go. You can find good ones on Amazon these days for really cheap. So I think like these are like 30 for $15. <laughs> you really can't get them cheaper than that. So, um, but in a beautiful, right? Yeah. So I love the scarves because again, I feel like when I taught preschool, I had things in my classroom and I would only use them one way. And so I'm always, we're gonna talk a lot about books and how you can use books in creative ways when we get to speech and language development, but I like this, we're gonna talk about scarves because scarves can be so many different things. It could be a, a hat, a veil, a cover, a crown, a cape, a bib, children love to pretend to be babies. A magic carpet, right? So think about all the things that your scarf can be and that's lots of fun. We're gonna keep our scarves for a couple different areas of development. For this one, we're just gonna talk about shapes. So what shape is this, everybody? Square. Square. A square. Good job. So you could sing the hat song. I don't know if you guys know that hat song. It goes, my hat has four corners, four corners has my hat. And if there weren't four corners, it would not be my hat. It could also be a blanket. 
or a pillow. So I love to let each child have a scarf. And I'll ask them, what other shapes do you think we can make with our scarf? A triangle. Let's make a triangle. Can you fold it in half? Try to make it into a triangle. How do you know? How do you know? It's a triangle. It's a triangle. Let's count the corners. One, two, three. One, two, three. Corners of three. Corners of three. Can you count the sides? One, two, three. One, two, three. Sides of three. Sides of three. That's how you know. That's how you know it's a triangle. You already know the song. Okay, now we fold it in half this way. We have a baby triangle. And we can make a wee wee baby triangle, right? What if we unfold it? What else can we do with it? What other shape can we make? Oh, a rectangle. A rectangle. You must have some good teachers. Okay. <laughs> So we're going to count, a rectangle has four sides, a rectangle has four corners, four sides, four corners, two sides are short, and two sides are long, and that's how you know it's a rectangle. You learn that song, you're never going to get a rectangle and triangle from people like that. Right? And then I like to put on an alligator mouth. Can you eat the middle of your scarf? Eat, eat, eat the middle of your scarf. And it turns into a butterfly. Fly, fly, fly. Fly, fly, butterfly. Fly, fly, butterfly. Fly, fly, butterfly. Fly up in the sky so high. Can you shake it? Flutter, flutter, butterfly, flutter, flutter, butterfly, flutter, flutter, butterfly, flutter and fly so high. Okay, so there's a couple different versions of that you could do. Twink your nectar butterfly. I it's one of the few songs I can sing in Spanish. One of the few. Boila, boila, mariposa, boila, boila, mariposa, boila, boila, mariposa. So you can make your scarf into a butterfly. Keep your scarf for later because we're going to do another song with it later. I need two volunteers to come up so we can do some activities with our sticks. Who wants to do it? I promise I won't make you do anything too embarrassing. <laughs> come on up. Oh, sorry. I'm like, wait. Okay. okay. So you're each going to get the sticks, and you're going to tap them together. So I would do this two different ways. It doesn't seem like most of you are working with children that are really, really young. But maybe if you have young twos um, or even young threes, you may want to just have them tap along, and you would demonstrate making the shapes. With my older threes, fours, and fives, kindergartners, I like to give them sticks, and I put them into pairs. And then they're going to work together to make the shapes, okay? So I'm going to sing the song. And you can tap together until I tell you what shape to make. Okay? Are you ready? Yeah. yeah. Here we go. Shapes, shapes, fun as can be. Come sing along and you will see. Shapes, shapes, fun as can be. Can you make some shapes with me? First we'll make a triangle. Work together to make a triangle. Oh, oh. Let's all make a triangle. Good job. You got it. Shapes, shapes. Fun as can be, come sing along and you will see. Shapes, shapes, fun as can be, can you make some shapes with me? Secondly, have a square. Let's all make a square. Yay! Shapes, shapes, fun as can be, come sing along and you will see. Shapes, shapes, fun as can be, can you make some shapes with me? Third, we have a line. Let's all make a line. Work together to make a long line. line Good job. Shapes, shapes, fun as can be. Come sing along and you will see. Shapes, shapes, fun as can be. Can you make some shapes with me? Fourth, we have a zigzag. Ooh. Let's all make a zigzag. <laughs> you got 
got it. Shake, shake, find a kimmy. Come sing along and you will see. Shake, shake, find a kimmy. Can you make some shakes with me? Fifth, we have a diamond. diamond. Let's all make a diamond. Shake, shake, find a kimmy. Come sing along and you will see. So another fun thing to do with partners is to make letters. So you could do that with letters. Letters, letters, fun as can be. Come sing along and you will see. Letters, letters, fun as can be. Can you make a letter with me? And it's great because if you have two sticks, I often will start that with just on their own. And we'll make three or four letters. And then we'll run out of letters we can make with two sticks. So I'm like, okay, well, let's work with a partner now and we'll do it again and see how many more letters we can make. So that's another fun thing you can do as well. We are going to, oh, another thing we we're going to talk about. I'm not going to get into this too much right now, but another fun thing to do is to work on grouping and categorizing. So in your classroom, you can go on a scavenger hunt and you can look for things that either live in the garden or things that maybe live in cold environments, things that live in the snow. You could look for things that are in the kitchen that grow on a tree or on a bush in your farmer's market. And then you can do a song with those things, right? But we're working on grouping and categorizing in different ways. So I use the fruits and vegetables and I sing a fruits and vegetables song that goes to the same tune as Open Chuffin. So Fruits and vegetables, fruits and vegetables are so good for you, you, you. Fruits and vegetables, fruits and vegetables make you strong and healthy too. And then whatever we found in our farmer's market or in our kitchen area, we'll name them. And then when we're done with my older students, we may talk about well, what grows on a tree, what grows on a bush, what grows on a vine, what grows in the ground. So that's a fun thing you can do as well. Or if you want to change the words to the wheels on the bus, right? We would do the wheels on the bus. You could do the sharks in the sea, go, chomp, chomp, chomp. Jellyfish in the ocean, go wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. The dolphins in the sea jump up and splash. Or you could do the, all the different bugs in the garden. The spiders in the garden go spin, spin, spin. So again, we're just kind of looking for things that live in an environment together. And we're working on grouping and categorizing and then building a song around that. So, we're going to move on to speech and language development. Speech and language development starts with babbling, gestures, sounds, and then words and sentences. Caregivers and teachers can support language development by engaging in lots of communication with their students, responding to questions, reading aloud, and singing in the classroom. The positive quality of adult-child interactions and increased verbal responsiveness are essential in shaping a child's literacy, environment, and language development. So, long before I ever had a book, <laughs> I've been teaching yoga this way. So, we're going to talk about this. How many of you have the book in your classroom, Is Your Mama a Llama? How many of you have the mitten? Commotion in the ocean, rumble in the jungle. What's the third one that they do? Commotion in the ocean, rumble in the jungle. I'm blanking on the other one. Um, Good night, gorilla, brown bear, brown bear, polar bear, polar bear, panda bear, panda bear. What do all those books have in common? There's repetition. They're rhyming. They're rhyming. And, and they're based around what? Animals. So for years and years and years, I've been doing yoga with my students before like yoga was very cool. Like now there's like a yoga studio in every block, but I started doing yoga with my students when there was like a yoga studio in every county, <laughs> or maybe two in every county. Um, and the reason why I started doing yoga is because when I was in college and I was dancing 25 hours a week, I had a lot of friends that were getting injured and they would go away and they would do yoga and they would come back to dance and it would be like they had gone to some amazing school and everybody would be like, where have you been studying? And they're like, I've just been doing yoga and Pilates. And their strength was incredible. And then teachers eventually wanted dancers to start doing yoga to decrease 
the chances of injury and stuff like that. So for me, yoga wasn't really about all the stuff that it is. I mean, it's always been about that, but that's not why I originally got interested in it. I got interested in it because I was trying to do strength training and all of those things. And then once I started doing it, I realized there were all these other benefits, the mindfulness, the being able to breathe, calm down. We all need that. <laughs> so um, being present, being in the moment, living, coming from a place of gratitude, all of those things, right? Um, so I was teaching music and dance to children in my early 20s, and people started finding out that I did yoga, and they're like, well, why don't you do a yoga class for kids too? And back then, there was like only maybe two people doing that. And so I said, oh, okay. And because I wanted to make it approachable, I started thinking about how can I do musical yoga with songs that I like, and how can I do story time yoga with books? And so I always kind of would go to these books that had series of animals, because it was really easy to take the book come up with a basic yoga pose for each animal in the book, and then turn it into a story time yoga. So that's what I wanna to talk to you about today. So if you have any of those books, just pick up the book and go through the pages and start to think about the animals in the book and what kind of yoga pose would work. If you're not confident in yoga, you can go online and Google the most 10 common poses or popular poses for children. And if you learn those 10 poses, you'll be able to do about 100 animals. Because downward dog works for any four-legged animal. Happy baby works for any animal. Here, let me point so you can see what I'm talking about in case you don't know what poses I'm talking about. So downward dog works for any stretching animal, right? Happy baby works for, in this book, it's a chinchilla. But it could work for a bat hanging in a tree, a possum hanging in a tree, a sloth in a tree, a pig rolling in the mud a polar bear rolling in the snow. So I want you to just think about all the different animals that one pose could be, right? Or that one animal could be. So um, child's pose could be any resting animal, any sleeping animal. So we're gonna do this book and I'm gonna demonstrate the poses just so you can kind of see how I turned that activity into an original book. But I don't want you to feel like you have to go buy special books. Just use the books that you already have that have a series of animals and you can do the exact same thing. Because we're trying to save time and get in a lot of activities, I am not going to read this to you. Because if I was to read this to you and stop and do the yoga pose three to four times like I would with my students, it would take about probably about 15 to 25 minutes to do the book. And I don't want to spend that much time on this one activity. So instead, we're going to listen to the music that's professionally recorded that goes with the book. And I'm gonna need someone to flip the pages so that I can show you all the yoga poses. So who can I get as a volunteer to turn pages in a book? Well, come up, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Here we go. So we're gonna go on a trip around the world. We're gonna visit each continent and we're gonna find a native animal in each continent and we're gonna do a yoga pose for that animal. And again, this can be done with the music, but um, but as you're going to see, it's pretty quickly we're moving through the poses rather than if I was reading it, we could really stop, take our time, breathe, relax, all of those things. <laughs> yeah, it really helps a lot. There you go. Just hoping it works because if there's no, if my internet doesn't work, sometimes it's an issue. But I think it's going to be fine. Here we go. There it is. Okay. A big plane fly across the sky. Look at all the clouds. Trying to go where they can see me. Okay. Over seven continents and five oceans too. Off we go together, learning something new. Yoga adventure. Where will it take you? First stop is North America. Move like a bicycle in a yoga pose. Big and strong with warrior arms and steel our chains so strong. We're tend to ride a bicycle, pedal very far. Through the forest, past the trees, quick it's getting dark. Through North America and Central too. Off we go together, learning something new. South America, me and you. Roll like a chinchilla in a yoga pose. 
side to side in the dust, moving fast and slow. Now, let's go and explore Europe. Europe, up and stretch like a gray wolf. Stretch like a gray wolf in a yoga pose. Push your tail up to the sky. We can make a part of a ball by leaving with your back leg. the name of the animal or the, the form of transportation or animal. And then we have the American name and the Sanskrit name, like the traditional yoga name. But if you were to go online and you were to Google, um, I feel bad that people on the cam camera didn't see any of that. I'm sorry, virtual people. I can hear, but you can't see me. I know I was on the ground doing yoga poses. I'm sorry. <laughs> they can see me now, okay. <laughs> Um, so when I wrote this book, I didn't think about using it as a workshop or I would have done less poses on the ground. <laughs> I was thinking about sitting in circle time with the students. And if you're going from a seated position, getting into the poses, it's actually much easier to go from pose to pose than it is to go from standing to, you know what I mean? So I was had my teacher mind on, I didn't have my presenter mind on. So <laughs> anyways. If you Google the most common yoga poses, you'll find simple poses that you can do. And one of the things I always say to people is if you're not flexible or you have injuries, which is a valid concern, you know what I mean? Like you don't want to hurt yourself teaching. Everybody has a child in their class who loves to help the teacher. Everybody, right? Does, can everybody think of one child in their class who would love to be able to demonstrate the poses because Teacher Jamaica has a bad knee right now, so I need Susanna to show everybody how to do the poses. So everybody has that child, so utilize your students, and they will love to help, right, and demonstrate and help out. And then that way, everybody still gets to participate. And you can also use it as a learning um, experience. You can tell your students, not everybody's bodies work the same, right? Some people can do things that others can't, and that's okay. And we don't want to do anything that hurts our body, right? We want to take care of our body. 
especially with yoga. We're not trying to force things. We're trying to do things that feel good, stuff like that. Okay, we are going to move on to the next activity, which is going back to descriptive language. So you guys still have your scarves. Everybody still has their scarf. Okay, so we're going to talk about using our scarves in creative new ways to reinforce symbolic play and explore descriptive language. So, we talked about some of the things our scarf can be, but we didn't talk about a kite. Can you pretend like your scarf is a kite? And can you fly it high in the sky? Okay. My kite is up so high. My kite is up so high. Oh my, just look at it fly. My kite is up so high. The opposite of high is low. Low. Shake it down by your low. toes. My kite is down so low. My kite is down so low. Oh no, where did it go? My kite is down so low. Can you shake it really fast? The wind has caught my kite. The wind has caught my kite. Oh my, just look at it fly. The wind has caught my kite. Can you throw it up? My kite is falling down. My kite is falling down. Oh no, it hit the ground. My kite is falling down. We'll do one more. Do you know what else your scarf could be? It could be a window. Can you look out the window? Let's have it be a special window on an airplane. Ooh. Looking out the window, looking out the window, way up high, way up high, flying in an airplane, flying in an airplane, through the sky, through the sky. It could also be a sail on a sailboat. It could be all sorts of things. So we are going to... We're gonna talk about gross motor. I'm already winded. We haven't even gotten to gross motor yet. <laughs> We've been doing a lot of gross motor. Okay, so um, motor skills are important because they are used every day throughout our lives. Motor skills are broken into two categories, fine motor and gross motor. Both are essential for a child's growth, independence, and confidence. Gross motor skills refer to the skills needed to do larger movements that involve the large muscles, the legs, the arms, and the trunk. Okay, so we're gonna do a yoga game, <laughs> a much more calm yoga game. I need some volunteers and I promise it won't make you lay on the ground. Okay, can I? <laughs> and I need you, and I, this time I'm gonna make sure that they can see us because I feel bad that we were over there. So can I get four people to come up and we're gonna hold hands and walk in a circle. I promise it won't be too bad. <laughs> so we're going to hold hands. Let's come over here, though, because I want people to see. So if you stand right here, they can see you. Perfect. Okay. So we're basically going to... Oh, yeah, yeah. oh, you don't want to do it? It's okay. <laughs> you don't have to. I thought you were standing up. Sorry. Okay, so we're going to hold hands, and we're going to make a circle, like we're singing Ring Around the Rosie, but we're going to change the words. So watch out. Maybe come over here so you don't have that thing there. So no, I don't want you to trip over it. Okay. So we're going to sing. Ring around the lotus. Let's make yoga poses. Breathing. Breathing. And make a yoga pose. Can everybody stand tall like a mountain? Tall like a mountain. We're going to be a special mountain that has volcanoes, lava inside. Are you ready? On the count of three, we're going to push our volcano lava all the way up to the sky. Our hot lava. Breathe in and make the sound of your hot lava erupting. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Good job. Let's do it one more time. Let's hold hands. Bring around the lotus. Let's make yoga poses. Breathing, 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 breathing. And make 
ain't got no bones. Okay, um, do you want to do airplane pose? You don't have to lift up your leg that high. There you go, behind you. There you go, good job. Let's give our volunteers Yay. a round of applause. Thank you. So again, you can do that a couple different ways. You can have a child stand in the middle and pretend to be the lotus flower. Um, you can have it be more student-led by letting them pick which poses they want to do, especially if you have a small group, like six children. I always say when you're doing an activity like that, instead of having all 12 or all 24 of your students try to make a circle and go around, split them up. Do three groups of six or two groups of eight or five groups of four. And even if you're in the classroom, you know, like let's just say the preschool I taught at, we, you'd walk in the door and we had story over here, like a story area and cubby. And then if you walk through the hallway, which was still, you could see it from the other room, we would have our circle time area, we had tables and chairs, and then behind the tables and chairs, we had free play. So if I was back at that school, I would have one group in the library area of four or five or six kids, one group in the circle area, and one group in the free play area, and I would just kind of stand in the middle like the referee to make sure everyone's happy and okay and no one's getting hurt, right? So it's just easier for smaller groups to work together, and you're less likely to have somebody like, you know, fall over, get injured, get hurt, and then that way, if you want them to each take a turn and have it be more student-led, there you can do that, whereas if you have a group of 18 kids, you're gonna be doing Ring Around the Lotus for an hour, you know? By the time you get to that 14th child, no one's even paying attention anymore, so. That's a fun little gross motor game you can do, inside or outside. Okay, we are gonna move on to our next one, which is a really fun movement activity that I love to do with my students. Um, this is a song that I just thought everybody knew, and then I realized as I started doing more and more of it, uh, workshops, and I would bring it up that like a lot of people didn't know the song and it's such a cute song then like, okay I'm gonna start teaching it to people when I do workshops so it's called see the bunny sleeping how many of you have heard this song see the bunny sleeping see I'm shocked okay I'm glad I'm always so nervous my biggest fear is I'm gonna come here and just do tons of stuff you already do and you'll be like I already do all this stuff right so I'm just always trying to come up with something different so um, you can do this in lots of different ways you can have the children pretend to be the same animal and you're just going to sleep and waking up. Or I like to do it where they're switching. So we're switching types of movements. So maybe they're bunnies and then they wake up and they hop. Maybe they're bumblebees, they wake up and they buzz. Maybe they're sheep, they wake up and they gallop. Or maybe they're birds and they wake up and they fly or they swim like fish. So you can change the animals. The original song goes, see the bunny sleeping, Till it's nearly noon, shall we try to wake them with a joyful tune? That are they ill? They're so still. Are they ill? No, they're not ill. They got little bunnies. Hop, little bunnies. Hop, hop, hop. 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 Now go back to sleep, little bunnies. Now because of COVID, we no longer want to say ill. I really feel that way. I feel like we've been talking about people getting sick so much. So I'd actually change the words slightly. <laughs> and now I say, see the bunny sleeping till it's nearly noon. Shall we try to wake them with a joyful tune? They're so still, very still. Wake up, little bunnies. And then they wake up and they hop. But it's a really fun one to get out all those wiggles and all that energy and you can make you could make it be a yoga pose or it could be a movement, right? Either or would be fine. We are gonna move on to fine motor development. And I'm not gonna read to you the description because we have 15 minutes left and I wanna get to social emotional learning. So let's talk about fine motor. Um, one of the things I really like to do for fine motor, when you're gonna get my notes, there's gonna be like three activities in each category that we didn't even talk about. So you guys, but you'll be able to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> or find anything. Um, one of the things I love to do with fine motor is to incorporate a prop into the, the time, into the, um, sorry, into the song. So, I'm going to show you a couple ideas. So, what's this? A traffic light, stop sign, right? 
So this is a flap of a box because when I make props, I'm making them often for 10 teachers. <laughs> and sometimes I'm making them for like multiple things. So, but if you were to do this, how many flaps are in a box? Four. Ooh. Eight. 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 So you just cut the top and bottom and you have eight backdrops to your traffic light. Depending on the students you're working with and how old they are, they can maybe be able to cut their own boxes. They can trace and cut their own circles or they can just cut them or they can just color them or paint them depending on what, you know, what age children you're working with. And then they can make a traffic light. And then once you have your traffic light, you can sing different songs with it, right? So we could do twinkle, twinkle, traffic light, standing on the corner bright. Red means, green means, yellow means please take it slow. Twinkle, twinkle, traffic light, standing on the corner bright to twinkle, twinkle, little star. That's one option. You could do a counting song. I'm gonna do it right here so they can see me. Keep wanting to go over there. Okay, so I have my race cards. I'm gonna put it in front of here. So we have, I'm just gonna do three instead of five. So I have three little race cards all in a row. So imagine you have your race cards, you're in your circle time, and everybody has their own traffic light, and you're doing the song together. And then they can take their traffic light home and they can teach their parents the song, which is so nice, right? So they love having ownership over something, right? Something they, had, they did at school with their friends. Now they get to go home and they get to not just tell their parents about their day, they get to show their parents what they learned at school. So we have three little race cars all in a row. You already know the words. Red means? Stop. Green means? Stop. The light turns green and one drove away. The light turns red and two had to stay, right? Very simple. So let's try it. Three little race cars all in a row. Oh, that's not the right tune. <laughs> Three little race cars all in a row. Red means stop and green means go. The light turns green and one drove away. The light turned red and two had to stay. Two little race cars all in a row. Red means stop and green means go. The light turns green and one drove away. The light turns red and one had to stay. Okay, again, I'm not going to go through the whole song, but you get the idea. You'll get the lyrics. It's on our YouTube channel. The reason why I say the YouTube channel is important is because I do this for a living and I still have moments where I'm like, I can't remember how that song goes. And I have to go look, listen to it, right? Even if I have the lyrics because I can't remember how to sing it. So it's a good reference point. So that's a good one I like to do with my younger students. Now with my pre-K, my TK students, I like to make letters. So what letter is this? F. F. What letter is this? A. a. What letter is this? What do you think we're going to spell, friends? Fall. Fall. And we have another letter. L. So when I point to the letters, I know you can't really see them. Tell me what sound they make. Ah. Ooh. Ooh. Good job. You put it together and it spells fall. That's the season we're in. So we do this at Jamaroo. We have about, we do a new word every month. So during the summer, we have the letters beach. We have them, we have the letters A-P-P-L-E for apple. We have the words yoga. So we're gonna make a rhythm and we're gonna basically change the words to bingo. Here we go. My most favorite season is when all the leaves are falling. F-A-L-L, F-A-L-L, F-A-L-L. I really love the fall. What do you think could be on the back of the F? Some feathers. So now we're going to clap one time for the picture, and we're just going to say A-L-L. -L. Are you ready? So again, same thing that you do with bingo, but we have a visual prop, right? My most favorite season is when all the leaves are falling. Clap. A-L-L. -L. A-L-L. A-L-L. I really love the fall. So
So there's a million versions of these songs that we have on our YouTube channel. We do, um, I like to breathe and stretch when I practice yoga. Y-O-G-A, Y-O-G-A, Y-O-G-A. Let's do some yoga. And then on the back, we have an animal that you could do a yoga pose for. So this is the thing. We make these, but it's really fun to have cardstock and to have your students create them. Because remember, we're talking about fine motor right now. So they create their own set of cards. They practice writing the letter. You can either have them draw a picture on the back or you can do scrapbooking type stuff where you have different things that they can look through to find things like a scavenger hunt that start with the right letter and put it on the back. You could also just put out stamps and stickers of things that start with just these three letters, right, F-A-L and make it more like a matching. They have to find the thing that starts with an A, find the thing that starts with an F. Um, but there's a lot of different variations that you could do. And it's just a fun way, again, for them to get some fine motor skills in there and then bring it to circle time. Everybody has their own set of cards and we're gonna do the song together. You can keep their little set in a Ziploc bag and you practice it over the course of a few weeks and then they can take it home and they can teach their parents the songs that they learned, and imagine how much they're gonna understand what F does after that, right? <laughs> they're not gonna forget what F is. <laughs> so um, just another, another fun way that you can bring in some fine motor development. We're gonna move on to social emotional learning in our last 10 minutes of class. It's kind of ironic that I I pick breathing and relaxing as the last thing that I'm the most, next time I do a workshop, I'm gonna do social emotional learning first. Okay, so, <laughs> so, but it's a nice way to actually end the workshop. So, we're gonna talk about social emotional learning. Social emotional learning is the process by which children learn to recognize and identify their own emotions and the emotions of others, make connections with others, establish relationships and friendships, learn to make good decisions, manage their reactions to their emotions, and approach challenges and express empathy. So we're not gonna go through the examples, but we are gonna talk about breathing today because I feel like breathing is a very, we, I do a lot of breathing in my circle times, in my music classes, in my dance classes, and in my yoga classes. And I just think it's something that I need to do sometimes as a teacher. I'm a very high-strung person. And sometimes I need to take a breath. So I'm trying to teach my children, my students, to do that too because I didn't learn that until I was much older and I wish I had that skill when I was younger. So the first thing I want to say about breathing activities is that um, breathing is one of those things. This is my opinion, by the way. So I've been working with kids for over 20 years, but this is just my opinion. So you may have a different opinion. But I think if you want children to have breathing as a tool in their toolbox, it needs to be something that they're practicing on a regular basis so they feel comfortable with it. And if it's not something that you're doing kind of on a regular basis, then I feel like it's harder for them to use that tool in their toolbox, right? It's like, I'll use the example of a drill. I have a drill in my toolbox, I don't know how to use it. I never ever practice with it, I don't know how to use it. I, every single time I get it out, I forget because it's like once every five years, right? So it's the same thing. If you want them to have that tool in their toolbox, you need to be using it on a regular basis. And there's so many wonderful opportunities throughout the day that you can use breathing as a transition, as part of your transitional periods of time. So I think coming from free play to circle time, coming from the yard inside, getting ready to eat snack, as you, when you sit down to have snack or sit down to have lunch, right before nap, right before story time. Anytime the energy is kind of changing in the room, or you're transitioning from one activity to the other, is a wonderful time to just stop and say, okay, we're gonna come inside now, but before we do, let's do a little breathing. Let's slow down a little bit. Let's think about how much fun we had on the yard with our friends, and let's do a breathing activity. Now, the other thing about it is, I like to give breathing fun names, because I just think kids have more fun if you're like, let's do fun bunny breathing, then you're like, let's breathe. Right? Like I would, I personally have more fun doing bunny breathing. So I'm going to teach you about five or six different fun breathing activities. And then you can think about if you want to start incorporating them into their day. Because then when your student is building an elaborate sandcastle 
or a block structure and their friend goes and bumps into it and destroys it, instead of them screaming and yelling, they, you can go up to them and say, okay, I know you're angry. Let's do some gorilla breathing and see if it makes us feel better. And then we can talk to your friend, right? Rather than, and then they're not yelling at their friends. So their friend is actually gonna hear what they're saying. <laughs> um, but again, if you're not practicing that, I think it's harder for them to use that, that breathing activity. So the first one we're gonna do is balloon breathing. I do this one first because breathing is very abstract. And so I think it's good to give kids a way to see what breathing is. One way, I have a mask on so it's not gonna work, but if you hold a scarf up to your face and you breathe in through your nose and you breathe out through your mouth, it will move the scarf. So that's kind of a nice, fun activity you can do with students with a scarf or a tissue and they'll be able to see their breath. Another fun way is balloon breathing belly. So put your hands on your tummy. We're gonna take a really big breath in to make our belly really big. And then we're gonna breathe out and make our belly really small. And breathe in like you're filling your balloon up. And breathe out. And breathe in. And breathe out. Another one I like to do is a snake breath. Can you breathe in through your nose? And push all the air out to make the sound of a snake. Breathe in through your nose. Breathe out. Now can you put on little bumblebee wings? And this time what we're gonna do is we're gonna breathe in through our nose, we're gonna press our lips together, and as we push the air out of our body, we're gonna make a humming sound, but we wanna keep our lips pressed together, okay? So breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Good job. Okay, the last, next one we're gonna do is bunny breathing. We're gonna do little sniffs in through our nose, one big breath out of our mouth. Wait, yeah, out of our mouth. Sorry, I had to think about that. <laughs> okay, little breaths in through our nose like we're sniffing. Little breaths in through your nose. Little breaths in through your nose. And the last one we're gonna do is gorilla breathing. This is my favorite to do when a child is angry. Angry like a gorilla. Okay, because I have to tell you, I've done this like many times and I rarely have a child who does not start laughing. Because it's fun and it's funny and it's like, it completely changes their state, right? So they go from being angry and then they're laughing and then it's like all of a sudden we can have a conversation, right? So. So what you're gonna do, and, and you could do gorilla poses and whatever you want, but we'll just do the breathing part. So we're gonna breathe in through our mouth, through our, we're gonna breathe in through our nose. And as we breathe out, we're gonna make gorilla noises like this. <laughs> okay, are you ready? Breathe in. Breathe out. <laughs> yeah, and if you want, you could add this. Oh. <laughs> One last time, breathe in, breathe out. So again, lots of different ways. There's many more breathing activities online, but those are just a few that you can start to do throughout your day. And then you can start to have conversations about how we can use those breathing activities when we're feeling angry, we're feeling a little nervous or anxious, we're feeling a little sad, we're having a hard time saying goodbye to our mom or our dad. At, at you know drop off time this is how we're going to end our workshop with my friend franklin so can everybody say hi to franklin this is franklin okay he he's not very happy to be awake because he's nocturnal and he wants to go back to bed but he wanted to come say hi franklin the owl comes out at night he can see without any light he has a pointed nose where's your nose and claws for toes, where your toes? And eyes so round like Cheerios. Franklin the owl, Franklin the owl. He lives 
up in the trees. Hoo, hoo, hoo. That's where he feels at ease. Hoo, hoo, hoo. He's Franklin, Franklin the owl. He lives up in the trees. That's where he feels at ease. Where do you feel at ease? Where do you feel comfortable? Where do you feel safe? And what are some things we can do when you don't feel comfortable and safe, right? So the reason why I'm stopping with that is because as educators, we have these children in our care all day, or at least for long periods of time, and there's lots of little windows of opportunity to bring in conversations about feelings and emotions. And sometimes it's as simple as just one line in a song or one sentence in a book, right? But let's try to think about what those opportunities are and use them as ways to talk about feelings and emotions so that we can hopefully raise a society of people who can function a little bit better together than the world we're living in today. Um, with that being said, it's 3 o'clock, or it's past 3 o'clock. So I'm going to let you go. I just want to remind you that on this sheet, all of our free resources are here. So... Our original children's album you can find for free on Spotify, on YouTube, on every major streaming platform. You can find um, our YouTube channel with nearly 600 videos and lots of free resources on Teachers Pay Teachers. Teachers Pay Teachers is kind of a newer thing we're doing since COVID started. So we probably only have about 20 or 30 things for free up there right now, but we are continuing to add stuff. So. We will continue to do that. And then if you want to follow us on social media, we're always trying to share articles and resources and activities and stuff like that. Um, if you give me your email, I will definitely send you the notes, which include the lyrics to the songs we learned, and I'll include the links to the YouTube and the Teachers Pay Teachers and all of that. And if you have questions, I'll be here packing up. So thank you so much for coming, everybody. And I hope that you learned at least one new thing that you'll do with your students. And I'll get the scars from you, too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.